Hello, this is Margaret Kiewicz, and I am here with Peter Paul Van Kempen. And Peter Paul is a trained psychologist um, and specializing in behavior change for sustainability. And, it, you know, for years he worked in environmental projects with high ambitions but little impact. And uh, this was very frustrating for him. And then he was almost ready to give up on on working on sustainability. And then he discovered uh, behavior design with BJ Fogg and got his training through him. And now he uses behavior design to develop communication strategies, policies, and action plans for his clients. And um, his latest activity is a new initiative, initiative to help people reduce stress by connecting with nature. And I think that this is super important, especially in this year of 2020 when we're all extraordinarily uh, stressed. And uh, so welcome to the podcast. And uh, I know that you're also working with us. You've been part of our Peace Innovation Network. And, That's right. uh, and as a, a peace tech entrepreneur, because we see a lot of connection between sustainability and peace, right? If we don't have a planet that is thriving, there's going to be more conflict in the world. And so these two are very closely connected. Um, tell me about your journey. So where did your love of nature and sustainability come from? Oh, thank you, Marguerite. I'm so glad uh, to be here and uh, honored also. And so my, my journey uh, started when I was a, a young boy and uh, always playing around in the wetlands lands around my hometown in Nijmegen here in the Netherlands. Uh, you know, I just love being outside, swimming, looking at the colorful birds and the fish and, and really love nature. So uh, one day in school, uh, the teacher told about uh, the, the fish dying, the rivers being polluted and uh, basically the whole uh, environmental disaster that was uh, uh, already happening. Uh, this really, this was for me, this was, I didn't know that about that, you know, this was new and it, it was, def I found it devastating. I found it difficult. I came home like in, in tears and I thought, what, what is, what's going on? And I was really sad about it. So um, this, this kept being on my mind. I kept thinking about it, uh, of course, also because I was a lot of nature. Um, at those times, you also had these chemical spills in the rivers here in the Netherlands that sometimes the, the rivers were just full with dead fish. Uh, mm. So that's like you could see it actually happening. Um, so I wanted to become a biologist. I thought I'm going to become a biologist and I'm going to maybe help the poor animals and plants in this world that are being destroyed. So that, that, that was like actually my goal uh, initially until I realized that uh, when people are the problem, uh, people are also the solution. So I figured psychology must be the answer because it's all about human behavior. So that's uh, uh, why I studied psychology I combined it with environmental science and um, I went off uh, happily and excited to work in a career in the field, uh, working for a consultancy here in the Netherlands, here in Amsterdam, a very famous consultancy. And uh, only to find out, uh, you know, after a few years that uh, I was started to get some doubts, you know, what am I really doing? I was working on projects about packaging waste, uh, about uh, green energy, about trying to get people from the car, outside the car, uh, you know, take them from the car, take them uh, to the bike, you know, it should be easy in the Netherlands. But um, when you look really close, nothing really changed, nothing much, you know? I mean, it was, the projects had good intentions, uh, good ambitions, but, if, if you really look close, there was not much behavior change. Mm -hmm. And so I remember one night in the office uh, and I was working late overtime, uh, what I did a lot. I was alone, outside it was dark and it was raining. And um, I thought, what, what am I doing here? You know, I walked to the window and I remember that I saw the rain hammering down on the roofs and, and, the, and the lights reflected in the wet asphalt. Mm -hmm. And I figured like, this doesn't make any sense. How did I get here? I fell in love with, with nature as a little boy here. I'm working on projects that don't really make any sense because mm -hmm. nothing really changes. So that's so you said you said something interesting there because when people think about how to 
come up with solutions that are good for the environment, they naturally think about packaging because you think, okay, I don't want to do too much packaging because then it gets thrown away. So it would seem that that should have some impact or getting people out of their cars that should have some impact. So what was not, what was not working in those, in those interventions? Well, very good, good question, Margarita. So uh, what was not working was that it didn't have the behavior uh, as, as main approach. Uh, these projects were more like uh, communication, campaigning, uh, all those sort of things. But meanwhile, we were building roads and, and, and packaging products more and more. Uh, I mean, this was in the 90s. And uh, since then, you know, we built a lot of roads here in the Netherlands, even though we bike a lot. Uh, people got much, many more, you know, two cars per household. Everybody's driving to their job, mostly. Uh, so, um, so what... The thing is, I think that the behavior, to, to really target behavior and think, why do people do this? What is the specific mm -hmm. behavior? And how can you design a solution for it? You know, like uh, BJ Fogg at the Stanford University uh, has mastered. So mm -hmm. that was missing, that approach. Yeah, certainly. I, I've certainly seen that in, in my professional career as well, where um, all sorts of products and services are built with the best of intentions we want to change the world right um but then they fall short you know or and i see this a lot with ngos and nonprofits as well is that um they have a theory of change but it doesn't actually move people to take any particular action it seems like if anything certainly in the united states it's like donate money right it's like that's okay so you're just asking me to donate money or to to volunteer get involved but the call to action of get involved is so vague because it puts all the burden on me to figure out what you need that I could do. <laughs> and it's like, so it, it doesn't, so these think these efforts don't scale very far, or if there is something that does scale, um, like the ice bucket challenge of a number of years ago, which raises vast amounts of money for a very rare disease. So it was successful that way. But you know, if you look at BJ Fogg's model, it was a, it was a, a spot behavior because it was a one-time behavior. It wasn't something that was sustained, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. it's it's hard. It's hard, and and you know, even if you try to change your own behavior, it's difficult. Yeah. So there's like a list of things that you can do, of or maybe not do uh, when you try to change behavior. Like, uh, what is the specific behavior you try to change? Of after it is vague, you know. People should drive less. Okay, that doesn't work. You know, which people? When? Wh what should they do? Is there an alternative? How? How? What is the? What is the alternative? How? How attractive is the alternative? And how difficult is it? And how do you get people to make a change? You know. So, so um, that whole perspective was not. It's it's getting there now. You know. I mean, more and more. But you know, there are thousands and thousands of people working in, in government and, and corporations, and, and there's still only a small percentage that 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 starts to see uh, to starts to act different. So it's difficult. Yeah. Well, certainly in terms of the number of people that BJ Fogg has personally trained, well, he's trained you and I, right? But we know it's not in the thousands. <laughs> hmm. You know, the, he BJ, you know, as as amazing as his work is, it hasn't scaled until he published his book this year, where actually then it could be accessible to many, many more people, right? And it's it's one of the most successful uh, business books of 2020, I saw the other day, which is fantastic. And so hopefully we can get more people trained in the method and it can be as um, well known as design thinking, right? Because mm -hmm. then that, you know, if this is a, a common skill or it's a, a more broadly available skill, then we might be able to see the shifts that we need, right? And certainly one of the things I love about um, Beecher's method is breaking in things into tiny behaviors, into tiny habits. Now you're, you're certified as the tiny habits coach. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Tell that's me what, about that. Yeah. Well, well so what happened um, <clears throat> was um, on my journey on, on, on looking for powerful ways to, to, to influence behavior, uh, I came across BJ Fogg and I joined bootcamp, you know, behavior uh, to learn behavior design, not so much the tiny habits because it's only part of behavior design. 
So I was around the table with 10 other people from professional backgrounds, you know, um, working for industries, big corporations. I was actually the only uh, like independent consultant. And as we were there, we practiced uh, with, with uh, examples that appeal to everybody. Uh, for instance, like how can I reduce my stress or how can I start my day better? And that was like with the tiny habits method. When I came back to Amsterdam, I thought, well, you know, my day, I don't really start my day very well when I think about it, I realized. Let's see if I can start my day better. Um, and um, so I started by uh, uh, drinking a glass of water in the morning, first thing. And I have these uh, athletic rings in my, in my yes. <laughs> I have these athletic rings in my living room upstairs. So I would just hang on them and breathe in, breathe out 10 times. And that's it. And of course, celebrate eh, as emotions create habits. Um, and that kind of like triggered a change and, and that, that gradually grew and, and, and uh, evolved. And um, so I saw myself changing and this was, was gradually and easily and uh, also happily uh, because people change <laughs> best when they feel good about it, about, about themselves. So, um, you know, after, after a period of time, I saw myself uh, losing about 20 kilos, uh, getting really fit, uh, all these things started happening. Uh, so I also, when I was talking to my clients, sometimes they also adopted uh, some of these methods and I saw them changing. Plus I realized like, if you want to change behavior of other people, um, maybe you should be able to change your own behavior. You know, um, if you cannot change your own behavior, uh, then of course, you might be good in changing other people's behavior, but uh, it's, it's, it's a skill. And um, like you, you don't, wouldn't want to get, be trained by people to uh, ride a bike that cannot ride a bike themselves, you know? Or, right, right, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> it's possible, you know, it's possible. They can, maybe they have a lot of knowledge about bikes, et cetera, and they, they will stand by the road and say, no, nah, no, you have to do this. But if, you, if they step on the bike and fall over, I, you probably will look for another teacher. But uh, <laughs> so um, that's what happened with me. And I thought, well, um, this is so powerful. Let's, I want to become a tiny habits coach. So that's what I did. And, um, mm -hmm. and, so, and so in terms of your clients, what kinds of habits have you helped them develop? And has, have you been focusing on, on nature in that area? Yes, so uh, one of my clients is I work in, in the nature conservation uh, uh, world for, uh, for, for IUCN, the International Union for the Conserva Conservation of Nature. It's the world's mm -hmm. uh, oldest and largest environmental organization. So it's like started, initiated in 1948, something mm -hmm. like a United Nations of uh, the environment. Um, and it's like big, it's global. And, and uh, the people that work are very smart. You know, most of them are PhDs. They, they, they smart, very smart people. And many have a natural science background. So uh, that's, that's, you know, when you try to solve environmental problems, that seems logical. But then mm -hmm. um, the switch between um, trying to get people to behave differently, you need, mm -hmm. you need, a, a different, uh, a different uh, tool set. So one of the habits that I, I, I learned them, you know, they have a habit like we all kind of have. When you want to give a presentation, you make a slide deck. Often you make like, uh, because it brings a little bit of insecurity, uh, a slide deck gives, gives security. And, and if you have a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise, you, you want to put it all in that slide deck. So, um, so uh, one of the habits I, I, I taught them was, uh, for, okay, you have a slide deck of 70 slides with trillion bullet, bullet points. Let's, let's just throw this in the bin for a while and start from scratch. Why don't you tell me a two minute story and then use storytelling uh, as, a, as a tool and try to make that a habit to not start with the, with the facts, but start with the story behind it and to use the story structure as, as, a, as, an, um, you know, as a framework to, to package your knowledge and your message. 
Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I've been working on the past years uh, for the. Yeah, funny you should say that because storytelling has become as emerged as a an area of interest in our work as well, and how and we have a this project that we've been calling we call it the narrative prototyping project, where. Uh, before you do your business plan or you bid, you do your prototype or anything, you prototype it in a story. You talk about what you're going to do in the form of a story because it helps you understand, you know, how people are, might interact with it and so on. And it, it, it helps reveal things that might be missing <laughs> that you need to work on. But it's also, um, you can get a quick uh, reaction from someone. Do they buy into the story or not? before you go through all the trouble of writing software or developing a company or all these other things, does the story make sense? Yeah. Wow, nice people can remember well. stories. People can remember stories in a way that they can't remember a book of facts. Right. True. Yeah. Yeah. Your brain is hardwired for stories. Uh, for me, uh, a few years ago, that was, it wasn't, I, 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 of course I knew, uh, I heard about uh, stories, etc. But I, I was working with Nike, uh, who like integrated storytelling completely in the organization. Uh, when you get hired by Nike as an employee, you 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 get first like a few days of only storytelling. You know, they bring all the all the, the corporate culture and values and 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 things they transmit it with story. And um, so I dove into it and I studied it and I did a few trainings. It's actually logical because where do we come from? We're like hunter gatherers that uh, that 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 progressed uh, from um, uh, uh, yeah the inventing agriculture and 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 um, developing this high tech society. And stories were the main driver, uh, actually, I believe, for this for this journey, uh, because we imagine things and you uh, it's it's something that unites people. Uh, unites people behind the vision, um, and you can remember it. You know, how, how can you remember all that knowledge if there's no no books or nothing written? It's story. Yeah. yeah. So, how are you using story to help people connect with nature, and why why should people connect with nature? What are the benefits? Ah, well, that's a nice question. Yeah, that's um, so um, yeah, the connecting with nature. Uh, I, I, in this whole process of working uh, to save the, the, the environment, I completely got disconnected to, of nature. And I, I realized a few years ago, um, you know how it is, you're busy, you live in a big city. I was working for the IUCN in, in different places of the world, uh, uh, giving trainings. These trainings are always in hotels, you know, in cities. Um, so I got disconnected myself. And then the IUCN uh, the, the, uh, was working on, on, on a global program to reconnect people with nature because the connection with people uh, with nature is going down, you know, it's going down, of course, because we're li living in these mega cities, uh, like more than half of the people live in cities now and, and, and it's, it's going up. It will be like two thirds uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a number of years. And then it just, it, it, yeah, who knows where it will end? This graph of people living in cities compared to people living in uh, rural areas. It, it's, it's uh, the, you know, maybe in the end we will all live in cities. No, probably that's not probably not true. But um, people getting disconnected, and that's 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 harmful in many ways. So mm -hmm. um, there's this term even uh, that psychologists use called the uh, nature deficit disorder. So the benefits of being in nature is um, you can measure the nature connectedness. There's, there's an easy scale, scientifically validated, and uh, the, the, it's strongly correlated with, with happiness and, and uh, well-being. So people that have a strong connection with nature are happier. They're uh, more uh, relaxed, but it's also good for creativity. Uh, so it's also good for the, in the working sphere, you become more productive and more creative. Um, well, that might sound a little bit all egoistic, but uh, people also become more kind and more generous. Uh, oh, really? Know. Tell me why. How is it that that kind? Oh, because I love kindness. <laughs> yeah. You know, if I could so, get more kindness in the world. So nature 
triggers kindness in people? Yes. So I was also uh, wondering, how is that? How can it trigger kindness? Why do you become more friendly when your connectedness with nature comes up? But what these skills do is they actually measure how much you feel part of it as nature, how much you feel. Some people might feel as an outsider, you know, nature is something that's outside them. Of course, they can go to nature, but then it's like something different. You know, I'm a human and there, the nature is there. So there's a skill uh, from like being completely separated, um, which is not uncommon now for people that live in mega cities with 25 million people that never mm -hmm. come into nature that think oh, it's dirty, there's these animals, uh, it's uh, dangerous, and they see themselves completely as outsider. And on the other end of the scale are people that are think there's no difference between them and nature. They're, it's like one. And so it has to do with empathy, because um, mm. if you're very close with nature, uh, you have empathy for it. And if you have empathy for nature, your, your empathy for uh, living creatures goes up. Actually, there's now a famous uh, prize-winning Netflix documentary. It's called uh, mm. My Octopus Teacher. It's about a, a man in, in South Africa who goes, uh, who meets an octopus when he's uh, free diving with only goggles mm -hmm. and he starts to get acquainted with this octopus and he goes every day he starts to go every day to this octopus and he makes a movie about it a beautiful movie uh, and he, for him it was life-changing and also changed the relationships with his friends and with with his uh, with his wife because um because of, of this uh, bond that he felt with this uh, creature mm -hmm. so uh, yeah that's powerful. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. Uh, when I was growing up, I was very much a bookworm and I didn't like to go outside. So my parents would like, go outside and play. And I'd be like, I don't want to go outside and play. I'd rather be, you know, inside with the book. It's not until I became an adult that I began to enjoy nature. And especially in recent years uh, mm. to be able to go on long walks. And I have fallen madly in love with trees. Trees are my passion, especially oak trees. <laughs> Oh, wow. Because where, where, because where I live in Palo Alto, we have these beautiful, beautiful oak trees. And um, I go and visit them on my walks. They're, I have my favorite trees and I need to go and see them and see how they're doing. And um, I was not able to appreciate the beauty of nature when I was a little kid, because again, I was such a bookworm. But now I can't get enough of it. And mm. uh, certainly during the pandemic, I've been reading about how people have been bringing nature into their home because they can't go outside so all of a sudden it's it's sort of like um that loss aversion if you take something away from someone even if they never noticed it it's sort of like a little kid a toy that they never played with and you take it away all of a sudden they want it and so this rise uh, seeing this shift in behavior of people having lots and lots of house plants and of mm. course people going out and getting um animals as pets during the quarantine so they wouldn't be lonely Right. So mm. this connection between, you know, other species in terms of animals and also bringing plants into your home is a big thing now. Um, and then you see uh, a lot of people doing uh, small scale urban farming as well. Mm. And I think all of that is this yearning of wanting to literally get grounded. Mm -hmm. I certainly have found um on this trip to Santa Fe because the landscape is so beautiful and on the surface you go it's desert like what's interesting about desert but when you really sit with it you there's a lot of color in desert if you really look you know if you open your perception you could see lots and lots of color it's just not in a big concentration the way it is in a in a wet area that has more rain there's just little dots of color um, and that was something that jumped out on me but it was me slowing down. So what I find is that it, in nature, if I, for me to really appreciate it, I have to slow down and really be with it. Uh, and so I've been very grateful on this trip just to have that opportunity. Mm. Uh, and, you know, so at least for me, I can feel it reducing stress. And then maybe it's just because it changes the way I breathe. Mm. Yeah? Yeah, well, um... Uh, well, the, how it exactly works, that's not completely known. Um, but what you say about slowing down, uh, that's a good one. 
because it's also now clear how you can connect with nature. How, uh, there are some mm -hmm. specific behaviors. So that's why I thought there was a good match between behavior design and to connect people with nature. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of efforts of getting people uh, to connect with nature, but they're often like, they often aim to get people in nature, you know? You have to connect to nature, go to nature, be in nature. Um, but I remember myself that when I was stressed, I would just like go through nature, you know? You go, okay, I have to go to nature. Okay, we go, vroom, you know, you- Right, you're gonna do, make a drive, right? But you never stop and yeah, yeah. look you around, walk. you just, right. I mean, so you're with a friend and you're just blah, 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 or, or your mind just goes, blah, 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 you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't really work. So the interesting thing is there's like really specific behavior, which is like super effective to connect. And actually so what you is can, that? And you can connect also very, you can increase your connectedness also very fast. You know, it's not something I, I do these trainings and I ask people, so what do you, what do you need to do to connect with nature? Well, some people, they, they, they write right on the spot. They, they, they say you, uh, things that I, I would love to hear because they're like tiny behaviors. But many people come, oh, you have to go on a camping trip. You have to go on, you know, these big things that you mm -hmm. cannot really do. So what you do need to do is like a muscle nature connectedness. Mm -hmm. So you have to, to, to practice it. So, um, so then you come to habits because uh, if it's like a muscle that you need to train, uh, then you need a habit. Because uh, if you don't have a, need a habit, then, then the behavior will go up and down like, like the motivation wave. Are you motivated? Are you not motivated? You're motivated. It'll, uh, it'll... Mm -hmm. And the nature connectedness will also like fluctuate. So mm -hmm. uh, very uh, specific behaviors are actually what, you, what you're doing, Margarita. So you're a natural mm -hmm. and because you, you slow down. You have these oaks that you love, you know, you have this uh, yeah, uh, of course, we're not tree huggers, uh, that, 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 <laughs> but, 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 but you can still feel, you know, I, I, I have a, like a, um, a bond with a plant in the sense that you like the plant and that you enjoy to see the plant doing good. Um, so the specific behavior is um, enjoying nature with the senses, consciously. So uh, there's hearing, uh, seeing, uh, smelling. So then you need to slow down. Um, but you, it doesn't have to be big because you can also open the window and just look at the clouds and say, wow, you know, look at the clouds. It's amazing how they look. At... And if you do that for a minute, that's already good. Good. So that, that's one, one thing, the emotional connect, uh, the, the senses, which have also an emotional component. And this is, um, note how different this is, how often uh, the parks, uh, you, they're changing now, but often when you go to a zoo or to a park, there'll be all these signs saying, well, this is this is kind of animal, and then you get this number of facts. Mm -hmm. Or when you go to, um, so often the nature people, they like to give facts, you know? And that doesn't work, it doesn't help. Uh, not that's bad, it's not bad, you know, but it mm -hmm. doesn't increase the nature connectedness. So that's one thing. Uh, another one is to share what you feel. So if you if you if you see that beautiful oak, if you take a picture and you share it uh, with somebody, mm -hmm. or if you're taking a walk with a friend and you stop and say, "Look at this oak. It's amazing." Um, you know, I, I was just recently walking with a friend uh, here, and you have these huge old trees, and I was just. And as I went there, there are many times before, but now I just stopped and looked at it. Look, amazing, you know these mm -hmm. trees that are like a few hundred years old and how they look. And if you uh, take that in and if you share that, that's, that's strong. Um, also to create something, you know, you find some stuff and you make something or you sketch or you take a photo or you write something about mm -hmm. it. And compassion, you know, uh, when, you, when you take care of, of, of uh, living creatures with yeah. compassion, that's a powerful tool too. Yeah, it's... Um... I, again, in recent years, I've gotten far more sensitive to um, other living things, not, you know, there's humans, but other species, um, plants, animals, even matter, and saying like, oh, they, it's, you know, the planet is a thriving living organism, right? Many, many things are living on it. And then you say, 
oh, they they have their cycle, you know, birth and and reproduction and death and so on. And I don't know, there was something about maybe because I'm getting old <laughs> that I'm just more in tune to the rhythms of life and the circle, you know, those those cycles and looking at say like, oh, they're um they have a right to live as well. So I don't I, I don't even I, I look at weeds differently now. You know, you see weeds and you and people say, Oh, we need to pull the weeds out and I go, but the weeds have a purpose. Right? They they have a purpose in this ecosystem. Let them live. And 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 I find myself more and more inclined to just how can I help things live? And I think part of it, maybe in the back of my mind, is this awareness of so many species that are dying that are at the threat of extinction. And mm. even if they're like insects, you know, reading about how this insect apocalypse that uh, there was this article, this study looking at the, the significant drop of insects in nature and how certainly when I was growing up, you know, uh, in your car, the windshield, it would be splattered with insects, right? If you did a long drive. And then there was no, it's like, notice how you don't find dead insects on your, your car's windshield anymore. And it went like, you're right. You know, like, when did that change? I didn't even notice. And it just said something about how there's been such a drop in insect population. And mm -hmm. so now I see insects and I go, okay, I don't, you know, before like you want to like swat something and kill it or an ant step on it or something. I don't do that anymore. Like, okay, like, okay, you just need to go outside. This isn't where you need to be. I need you, I need to move you somewhere else. <laughs> but I have no desire, no desire to kill the insects because they're not harming me. They're just going about their business, right? So why would I, why would I kill another living thing that's just walking? It would be if some giant decided that they were offended that I was walking and they decided to step on me. I mean, oh, why, that's why, interesting, why would you do that? that? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I, I can uh, relate to that and I kind of have the same, uh, uh, ev I, I evolved the same way um, in, in the sense that, you know, after years of hard working I said, and disconnected, I didn't really care so much about nature. But the, the question is, that what is the causal relationship which way does it go because it could be uh, that uh, because your nat nature connectedness grew that uh, um, also results in, in more um, protective behavior towards nature that's proven so that's why um, it's a great foundation for if we want to save this planet to build it uh, this nature connectedness uh, that's the way the psychologists uh, call it nature connectedness and that there's a couple mm -hmm. of validated scientific instruments to measure it and um, it's proven that if your nature connectedness is uh, um, highly uh, correlated with uh, environmental friendly behaviors and uh, the willingness to protect uh, nature mm -hmm. and i kind of had the same uh, even during this COVID crisis, because uh, an, a close uh, uh, family member uh, was fell ill and uh, seriously ill, and uh, so so she 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 felt yeah she was being treated, and I was working on on this nature connectedness. So I thought well, I need to maybe this can mean something for her, you know, on a small scale because of course it will not heal her. So I I, I thought you know B J Fox style like what does she like to do? Uh, what behavior does she like? Well, she likes to 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 send uh, messages and app app messages. And she was kind of like stuck in the house, so I said to her like, uh, "Well, if you um, send me a photo of nature every day, I will send you one uh, photo too." Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we did for 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 months, um, uh, and I just took these pictures mostly around my house. I'm living in the historic center with the canals and 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 of course there's nature and and the parks um and during this process i, I noticed that i started looking at things very differently it just, mm -hmm. because I've, I've i've lived there many 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 years here and i started noticing all these things that i never noticed before uh, and also i started to feel uh, a stronger bond with the uh, yeah with the living things around uh, my my in this center it's it's funny it, so it, it worked <laughs> it worked yeah. on myself 
yeah yeah so maybe that's also uh, because i don't know how you, how you, how you you describe these walks i don't know if you took these walks all, uh, all your life or that you've been doing this no um, just in my adult life and so and actually more in like the, maybe the last five to seven years you know uh, i i i'm fortunate in that there i have um um my neighborhood is right next to stanford and so there are a lot of paths mm -hmm. little you know paths everywhere. we have sidewalks which makes it easier to walk uh, which sidewalks aren't necessarily common in california depending upon where you live we have sidewalks it's an old neighborhood uh the trees are very old uh well i mean old for california right it's 100 years old um the uh, but a lot of trails you know and uh stanford uh, the land was originally a spanish land grant right mm. so it's 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 very i mean the the land is very large around stanford and most of it is uh, undeveloped it is uh, uh, kind of a they call it an academic reserve. So it's kind of a nature preserve. So there are no buildings, it's just hills and, and nature and so on. Uh, so I've been very blessed with that. And so it had always been in my backyard for the last 30 years, but it wasn't until the last seven or the last 10 that I really paid attention to it because I started running in 2009. And so then I discovered all these trails. It's like, oh, I can run through these trees and I can run around this lake and all this stuff. Um, but prior to that, honestly, <laughs> I never paid attention to it. And then something about running made me notice. And then when I didn't run, I would walk and then I would notice. And after a while, the familiarity, it's almost like all oh, the landscape became like an old friend. Mm. Right. Just because of the repetition, just of that habit of repetition of looking at it and enjoy, and then discovering little parts of it that I really enjoyed. Mm. Um, so there's this little creek. And there's this, and I discovered this little area where it's quiet and water, the water pools around. And one day I noticed dragonflies. And the dragonflies had these beautiful golden coppery wings. And I would just sit there and look. And it was funny because normally I don't have that kind of patience. And I just sort of sat and I'm, I'm just gonna look at the dragonflies for a couple minutes, just give myself that, just to appreciate the beauty of a dragonfly. So it's almost like being like a three-year-old, you know how three-year-olds, small children, mm. you know, they'll, they'll come home. I remember my son would come and he would bring me little rocks, right? Mm. Cause he thought they were pretty or he would bring me like leaves. And I still have these leaves and they're like 15 years old now they're crumbling, but they were so sweet because he thought they were really pretty. So he's going to bring them back to his mom. Wow. Right. Well, that's that actually that uh, what you describe with the dragonflies. That's exactly the specific behavior which leads to a stronger connection to nature. So um, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but you can also also design it for yourself um, or f or for uh, people that want to connect with nature. You can help them mm. uh, to 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 integrate this kind of behaviors in their in their life. And. Um, and even um, you can even look at this at a at a at, a scre at your screen, uh, and you know if you if take the your 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 um, your computer screen and and the standard pictures that are on there, mm -hmm. and if you put a nature picture there, every time you start your computer, you you look at it for a, just a, just a little bit, and if you take if, and if you take a picture from nature that, uh, that you took yourself at a place that you love that you have a beautiful memory of um that that those kind of things they work yeah yeah i certainly um one of the things i enjoy is just taking photos of things that are beautiful on my walks mm. so on my instagram you know i'll if i see like the way the shadows are you know of a plant you know of a leaf ah. or flowers i mean flowers are always gorgeous um and the trees I'm trying to, I'm, it's funny because what I see and then what the camera captures, I can't quite capture how magnificent some of these oaks are. And I try, I'm trying to figure out that camera angle and the light and everything else. But <laughs> I, I do try <laughs> just because I want to remember. It's like, oh, especially there's um, this golden hour. The photographers talk about this golden mm -hmm. hour and it's in the morning and it's in uh, at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that, that, that. 
it's, you know, it isn't sunset yet. It's probably like an hour before sunset where the light is really beautiful. Mm. And it's normally when I go for my walks. So everything mm. looks really good. <laughs> it's wow. hard to take a bad picture during the golden hour. And the way <laughs> the, the, the sun hits the leaves, green leaves, will kind of yeah. give like this, it somehow it brings out the yellow in the leaves, so the gold. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really, really lovely. And so because I enjoy photography, I think that the, connect, the photography has been a way also for me to connect to get connected and really see nature in a way that I probably wouldn't have if I didn't have a camera, at least for mm. me. Well, it could very well be, Marguerite, that, that by these behaviors, that, that, that uh, they caused uh, you being so protective to, to ants that you want to like guide them outside the house and <laughs> still squash them, <laughs> because uh, it could very well be, yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah.